Welcome to the Australian Biocommons webinar series. My name's Christina Hall and I'm the Australian Biocommons Training and Communications Manager and I'll be your host for today. In this series, we aim to share useful information about the latest digital techniques, data and tools for the life science community. Each month, we hear from our local and international peers who present a bioinformatics topic that we hope will support Australians to deliver their best environmental, agricultural and medical research. We particularly appreciate those of you joining us live today, and you'll have the opportunity to ask questions via the Q&A function on your dashboard. And these will be addressed at the end of today's presentation. The session will also be recorded and you'll find it on our YouTube channel, along with recordings of previous webinars and workshops. We also hope you'll keep in touch to hear about future webinars via the channels listed on the screen here. Before we start today, We'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners and their custodianships of the land on which we meet today. We pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. We recognise their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. Today, we're thrilled to welcome Dr. Claire Sloggett to speak to us about the OzTracker platform and how it's being used for integrated pathogen genomics for SARS-CoV-2. Claire began life in computational physics before moving into genomics as a researcher at Melbourne Bioinformatics at the University of Melbourne, where I was lucky enough to work with her for years. She's recently moved to the Microbial Diagnostics Unit at the Doherty Institute to work on the OzTracker project as a senior bioinformatician and software engineer. So I'd welcome Claire. If you can turn on your microphone, your camera, and start sharing your screen. Thanks, Claire. Uh, thanks, Christina. Okay, great. Uh, so thanks, everyone. Um, it's really nice to be here. And I'm going to be talking about OzTracker. Uh, my co-authors co -authors on this talk are Torsten Seaman and Anders Goncalves de Silva. Um, this is going to be extremely similar to a talk which I gave at Abacus, so I apologise if you've been to Abacus, you've probably more or less seen this talk. Um, so what is OzTracker? So OzTracker was created to enable nationally integrated pathogen surveillance, and I'll talk about pathogen surveillance in a moment, um, using genomic data. So I'm, I'm now at the Peter Doherty Institute, which I'm at the, um, the Microbial Diagnostics Unit, which is, is part of both the University of Melbourne and um, the Department of Immo sorry, Immunology and the Peter Doherty Institute. And the MDU does uh, pathogen surveillance all the time. And there are public health labs around the country which do pathogen surveillance. But because Australia has a state-based uh, health model, it's, it's hard for people to do pathogen surveillance across jurisdictions. So it's difficult to share data outside the state, which means that if a pathogen crosses state boundaries, which of course they do, uh, you need some way to be able to compare the pathogen uh, occurrences in different states and find out what's going on. So we have to be able to share data between states and that's what OzTracker is about. Um, and OzTracker is there to, this is what uh, epidemiologists do, genomic epidemiologists do this work of outbreak tracking. And OzTracker is supposed to make their lives easier. It should support them in their work. So some epidemiologists do work in labs where they have a fair amount of bioinformatics support, but some don't. And it, it varies a lot. So we want epidemiologists to be able to spend more time interpreting the data and not have to worry about the bioinformatics or the pipelines or the compute infrastructure. And part of that is also that we want there to be consistent pipelines so that the data is actually comparable. Um, and the MDU usually does bacterial outbreak tracking, but of course right now we're heavily involved in SARS-CoV-2, which is the virus that causes COVID-19. So just a little bit about pathogen genomics. Um, 
I'm not sure what range of backgrounds the audience has. And if you have already, if you have a uh, genomics background, I'm gonna kind of, kind of assume this concepts are already a little bit familiar to most of the audience, but the really quick version. Um, so this is true, not just for SARS-CoV-2, this is true for pathogens in general, but uh, the this, this SARS-CoV-2 sample, so not the patient's DNA, but the, the viral DNA is sequenced to get the genetic sequence, which is a string that looks like this, or at least eventually it is. Um, at the sequences are compared to discover which are more similar, so which are more closely related. Um, and we build a phylogenetic tree using the sequence data. That's really the method by which they're compared. This is, by the way, this is not real data. This is a phylogenetic tree built out of fake data. I can't show you the details of the real data without permission. Um, some of it's public, but some of it's not. And as you can see here, we've got labels on the nodes, got samples from different states. Again, it's fake data. Uh, and this, this sort of tree lets epidemiologists work out which cases are probably related to one another. So who caught it from who, right? So if a case suddenly pops up in Victoria and we don't know where it came from, is it really similar to some cases in New South Wales that across the border? Um, do we need to let people in New South Wales know that maybe there was a leak from somewhere or some transmission chains that they don't know about? And you can't do this without data sharing across state boundaries. Um, and for those who do have a genomics background, usually when you're dealing with pathogens, you do multiple sequence alignment. This is kind of a picture of aligning multiple genomic sequences to find out what's similar. But for SARS-CoV-2, um, there's actually a very low genomic diversity and a lot of sequences. So we actually just compare to the reference and we don't really lose anything by doing that. And it scales because there's, there's more sequences than you're usually dealing with in a typical bacterial outbreak. Okay, and here, this is a picture of a small tree made of fake data. Here is a very zoomed out picture of the real tree. Uh, this is actually from December, the tree is bigger now, but as you can see, it's pretty huge. Um, there's tens of thousands of samples in the database. This is the Australian tree. This is not international samples. Obviously, the international samples is even bigger. Um, and as you can see, there's this thing down here. That's the Victorian second wave where everything's very closely related because it expanded really fast. Okay, so the way Austracker works, roughly, um, is that each jurisdiction uploads their, their sequence data. Um, they upload a consensus sequence. But the way it will work eventually and the way it was originally envisaged to work was that they could just upload their raw sequence data, so the FASTQ files. Uh, the reason we're currently doing consensus sequences is because um, SARS-CoV-2 ramped up quickly. It's a bit of a, it was for a while there, it was a bit of a wild west in terms of the methods people were using to sequence their data, like they're using certain Amplicon panels or whatever. And we couldn't rapidly implement all the backend pipelines to process all these different methods correctly. So we just let people upload their consensus sequence. This is the sequence of this particular virus sample, which is essentially fast day files, right? And that's working pretty well, but we will go back to letting people upload raw data. And we will also go back to using Austracker for, um, for other pathogens. Um, so I should say, actually, Austracker was originally envisaged to be for, for bacterial outbreak tracking. Um, but when SARS-CoV-2 came along, it was, it was the, the best option around and a good option for SARS-CoV-2 tracking. Um, so people, public health labs upload, or whoever does the sequencing can upload their sequence data. They retain ownership of that data. We don't share the raw sequence data. Um, we do aggregate analyses of that data, like on a national level, which at the moment most means building a phylogenetic tree that could come to include other visualizations and analyses. And that is made available to uh, the relevant users, so in public health units around Australia. And this is essentially uh, the, the, this little image here, which is the one I showed on the slide before, is a screenshot of what these trees look like. 
and we can put different metadata onto the nodes of the tree for people to see and let them search the tree and color by nodes and so on. And these, these views are used to generate reports which are used to inform policy making, policy decision making around Australia. So a little bit about governance, which actually was quite important. So OzTracker is not just a platform, it's not just an IT solution, it is a network of people and best practices and data sharing agreements. And that's perhaps, perhaps the most important part of it. And I'll talk about the timeline in a moment, but this was a long time coming. It's been a big effort to set up a structure in which people can share data across state boundaries because it involves a lot of levels of government and it's, it's an effort to make it happen. So OzTracker is, um, OzTracker is only able to do this because it's embedded within the public health system. Um, it's coordinated by the CDGN, which is here, the, communicate, the Communicable Diseases Genomics Network. Um, that was set up by the PHLN for the purposes of this project, essentially. And um, it is coordinated and maintained by the CDGN. So this has been a long time coming. Okay, it, these discussions actually started back in 2015. There was a symposium on applied microbial genomics and the CDGN was established. So it's been discussions going on for several years now and it's lucky that it was because um, when you need it, you need it and it takes a long time to have all these discussions. Uh, in, 2018, there was a contract to provide a roadmap in 2000, sorry, 2016. In 2018, there was a report on data sharing and genomics. And in 2019, everything kind of launched off. Um, the CDGN was endorsed as an expert reference panel under the PHLN and developed the National Microbial Genomics Framework. And then in 2020, or actually, as we know, uh, SARS-CoV-2 arrived in Australia and everything started to move pretty quickly. Uh, OzTracker was formally recognized as a platform for pathogen genomic data sharing, so that we would have one. Um, we have now a data sharing governance framework. And by the end of last year, we had more than 18,000 SARS-CoV-2 genomes uploaded to OzTracker. Um, and most of the develop, well, pretty much all of the development work, in fact, happened last year. So the actual on the ground development of the platform really started in March and April. Um, the endorsement of OzTracker as the national genomics platform by the expert reference panel was I believe in May. And I believe that's when the first phylogenetic tree was made available to viewers. Um, the governance structure wasn't formally finalized until June. And the governance structure is really important for this. And in August, the first SARS-CoV-2 national report was submitted that used data from OzTracker. And in October, the framework was endorsed by the CDGN, the PHLN and the AHPCC. Um, so it's all happened pretty fast. I only joined the project in August. So I've only been around for some of that time. I wasn't there for the initial development. Um, and I'm, I'm the second newest person on the project. It's just a small development team. So a lot of this is a lot of this work has been done um, by people who are not here today. But a lot of the work has been done by Anders and Tosten, who are the co-authors on this talk and who are on the first slide. So OzTracker was selected as the platform for this purpose in 2020. Um, at the time, the work going on was on backend optimization, developing analysis platforms platform, sorry, pipelines and getting them to work on different platforms and optimizing them. And the whole focus had to change rapidly to the front end so that there would be something that was immediately usable by epidemiologists for the things that were most critically needed. Uh, right now, the only pathogen that OzTracker is being used for is SARS-CoV-2, but it is designed to allow us to bring new pathogens on board later. Um, 
And some of the development focus had to change because SARS-CoV-2 has some specific needs. There's a lot of samples. Um, we've had outbreaks where it grows really rapidly and we've needed to incorporate all the samples from the whole country for the context. Um, there's been a lot of metadata needed for epidemiologists to be able to work out what's going on. So there's stuff about, stuff about exposure and timing. Um, there's lots of different sequences approach tried. As I said, we essentially deal with that by using consensus sequences, but the sequencing approaches have kind of settled down now and we will go back and put in some back-end pipelines to deal with that. Um, the phylogen phylogenetic trees, as you saw on that previous slide, are really big and all the existing tools that will render a tree just kind of don't work. So we're using a JavaScript library to render the tree, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, but if you just take the tree and just open it, it essentially freezes, right? You just can't look at that. And even if it doesn't, people can't look at it. People can't interpret something that big. So you need to give people tools to be able to navigate it and search it. Otherwise it just won't be usable. So we need to be able to you know, zoom and pan, but also search for samples or groups of samples or for metadata and, and fold and summarize the subtrees. Um, and every so often things happen because this is an evolving situation. So it's probably the most recent thing that happened in the that affected my work personally was um, that suddenly the focus shifted to these uh, international lineage, lineages, what we're calling variants of concern. So you've probably heard about them in the news, the UK variant or the South Africa variant. Are they in Australia and which states are they in and were they in Australia before and so on. So we kind of had to drop what we were doing and add a feature to Austracker where, where people can see which samples in Australia are of a particular lineage and are of the, one of the lineages of concern. Okay, so I'll just talk a little bit about the technologies behind Austracker, um, the platform itself. Um, it's been built using Anvil, which is a all Python web app platform. It can be hosted, although we are not using a hosted service. We are hosting it ourselves in the cloud. Um, Anvil uses one of the Python to JavaScript transpilers called Sculpt to compile or to transpile Python into JavaScript. So most of the code base is in Python, although not all. Um, and the main benefit of using this framework was that in 2020, getting the, the initial platform set up was really fast. So it was a month or maybe two, but almost more like one to get a usable platform going where people could actually see the data that they needed to be able to see of, of really like one or two people doing that. Um, it's still pretty extensible. You can take a custom JavaScript library or a custom piece of JavaScript and wrap it up and use it. You don't have to only use Python on your front end. Um, and in fact, we're using a, a library called Archipteryx.js, which was a pre-existing library for rendering the phylogenetic trees themselves and for navigating them. But we've um, made some changes and improvements to that to be able to handle SARS-CoV-2 requirements and to do the things that the epidemiologists need and we're continuing to make improvements to that library. Um, the backend pipelines are being built using Nextflow. Um, and we now, I think when I gave my abacus talk, we were in the process of moving, we now, run our production and our test instances on the Azure cloud, which is the cloud that the University of Melbourne kind of has, has set up. And that gives us um, more performance and stability. What we're working on at the moment, um, there's actually, it's not written here, but we actually are just finalizing a big database migration, which will give us more flexibility in how we use our database with, with moved platforms. Um, we're working on how we handle the metadata, which will allow us to show more fields on the tree more flexibly so we can more rapidly change what we show and upload extra data. Um, obviously we can't show just anything on the tree, it has to be things which are agreed between the member states as to what is allowed to be displayed. We don't show any private information. Um, 
although down the track we will allow people to display whatever they want without making it visible to other users. Um, and we're working on more improvements to the tree navigation. Uh, there's a whole lot of things intended for future work. Um, we want to be able to let epidemiologists look at the sample metadata in more flexible ways. We want to go back to working more on the back end. That's kind of restarted again, but this is the, the, the work that was kind of dropped when SARS-CoV-2 came along because we needed to focus on the front end. Um, but we'll go back to working on that so there will be more automated pipelines going on. Um, we probably want to add some additional visualizations of the data to the platform and more features to assist epidemiologists when they're actually generating the public health reports um, and more automated notifications. So right now, if there is an in possible interstate transmission event, um, we make it easier for epidemiologists to work that out, but there's no automated flagging of it and sending off of a message saying this looks like an interstate transmission event. That would be a good thing to have. And in particular, we would, at the moment we have a private code base and it's set up in a, we're, get, we're moving it to a framework where we can make it a bit easier for people to contribute. And we do want to have an open source code base so that people can contribute. So parts of the code base are effectively open source because we're using, for instance, uh, a pre-existing JavaScript library. So there are ways people could contribute now if they really want to, you could talk to us about it. Um, but the core code base, we need to open up and we do intend to. Um, so this is a really big page of acknowledgements because there's really a lot of people who contribute to this project. As I said, I only started in August. Um, Anders and Torsten have been involved for a really long time. Um, Sam started a little bit after I did and essentially Anders, Sam and I are the core dev team for Oztracker. Um, it's been great to have Sam around. He's our DevOps guy and he makes our lives much, much easier. Uh, Tia is our project manager and she's also wonderful. And this is essentially people at the MDU, including um, a whole lot of epidemiologists and um, my, microbi sorry, and geneticists and people doing microbial biology and um, also clinicians. And all of them kind of work with us and give feedback and use the app and make the development much easier. And we also have, of course, users interstate in every state who are working closely with us and we're in constant communication. Um, and we have the DHHS and the state government. Um, we have recently moved so everything's become a little bit more better down now if i could just go back a little bit everything has become a little bit more better down as of roughly the start of this year we have a fortnightly release cycle we're going to start having more regular user groups we've just kind of had some ad hoc user groups before now we do have channels where we can chat to users and we do that all the time but we're going to start formalizing the process a bit more and these these people represent kind of the public health labs around the country and their feedback is really invaluable in developing Oztracker as well. So I will stop there and I'm happy to take questions. I know this was probably quite short for a webinar. I apologize for that. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Short and sweet. Thank you, Claire. <laughs> So now's the time for you in the audience to send through your questions if you have any. So please type anything you'd like Claire to address into the uh, Q&A box down the bottom. Okay. Have a couple of questions in the um, Q&A box. Uh, one of those is what are the compute requirements of Oztracker in terms of CPU, GPU cores and RAM? Mm. That's actually a little bit hard to answer because we move the analysis over to our usual compute servers. So we don't have like a dedicated compute machine that only does us track out. We, we do it on the MDU compute engines. Um, but building the tree, as the tree gets big, it is demanding. It takes kind of hours, it builds overnight. So there's a tree released every day. Um, but I'm sorry, I don't know the RAM requirements. 
it is something I can find out. But it is it is pretty demanding. Building a large tree is computationally demanding, and MDU does have um, you know multi terabyte nodes. There's a question, any chance of integrating international samples for global real-time surveillance? Yes, we are doing that, um, especially with the these variants of concern or lineages of concern as they come in. And it looks like they may, there's some talk of a Brazilian variant. Um, we may get more lineages we care about at the moment. Uh, people are mostly looking at what is being called the UK variant, which is B117, and the South Africa variant, um, which is B1351. But for purposes of comparison as, as people come into the country, because that's where our outbreaks come from, um, we do want to be able to compare to international samples. And those are available, right? There is an international database, uh, Gizade, which is being used for international SARS-CoV-2 samples. Uh, we don't only use Gizade data because we include some stuff that the states might, for whatever reason, not be willing to upload to a public international database. Um, people can upload stuff to OzTracker and it's a little bit more private. And we can also use it for metadata fields that would not be okay to make public. But we can we can bring stuff in from Gizade and we do. So people can upload their public stuff to Gizade and we bring that in and we can get international samples from there as well. And we have recently started including, obviously not all international samples because that would be millions, but a kind of representative sample of international samples for global comparison. I should actually say, I forgot to mention it earlier on, but we are essentially sequencing all our COVID cases, which not a lot of countries are doing, but Australia since quite early on has been sequencing everything. So we have a lot of data. Um, the importance of rapid sequencing turnaround time is really important and it has been all along. Um, it's partly because this affects It affects the public health response, right? So um, it's been important all along because when there is an outbreak, you want to you want to figure out what's going on. Um, you're right, it is now also what's telling us whether it's one of these international lineages. Um, but I do, we, we expect that um, because they, the UK lineage in particular seems to be more transmissible. We expect it's probably going to become the dominant lineage. And as you've seen in the news, when we get new cases in Australia now, they're starting to be that lineage. So that's probably just how it's going to be. Um, it's a question that says, it's actually got a couple of different questions. So I'll just say them one at a time and then answer them one at a time. So one is, could you explain raw sequences versus consensus sequence? So, um, I probably need a whole slide for it, <laughs> but when when next gen sequences do their sequencing, there is there's actually a bunch of different ways to do it. So do it. Most SARS-CoV-2 sampling now is being done what's using what's called the Arctic protocol, which is an amplicon protocol, which means that you have some little bits of DNA called primers, which bind to because they match, they bind to parts of the virus DNA. So when you put your DNA sample in, you've got the patient's DNA in there too, right? You biologically, just to take a sample, you swab them or whatever, and you get hopefully some virus on your swab, but you also get obviously the patient's cells on your swab. And if you extract the DNA from that, you're gonna have human DNA and viral DNA and possibly other DNA mixed in. And so what these little primers do, these little sequences that, that match and bind to the viral DNA is they pick the viral DNA out of the rest of the DNA. And then you can run that through your your genes, your sequencer, and it gives you the sequence of the virus, but it gives it to you in little snippets, right? So what it actually gives you is a whole lot of strings of a certain length, like a hundred letters long. So if you've seen, I don't know if I should share the screen, but if you've seen um, sequence data that looks like AAGGCT, right? It's a, it's strings like that, each kind of a hundred letters long, and each one is a little snippet of the viral DNA, and that's the raw data. Um, and you need to do something with that, like assemble it, which you often do for bacteria or align it. Um, and in this case, we're comparing it to a reference sample from the original uh, SARS-CoV-2 breakout, break, breakout in, sorry, outbreak in Wuhan in China. Um, 
SARS-CoV-2 is a very slowly mutating virus, so it's possible to do things with this sort of comparison. Um, and because it's a very slowly mutating virus, that also makes people's lives hard because when we had our second wave in Victoria, a lot of the sequences were very similar, which makes it very hard for any genomics to work out what's going on because uh, you assume that so if, if my virus sample is similar to yours, maybe I caught it from you, but if everyone's is similar, you kind of don't know what's going on anymore. Um, but now that we're kind of back to this state where we've got things under control and when we see the virus in the country, it's because it's, it's come into the country from outside. Now it makes it more possible again to, to compare these samples to one another and see what's similar to what, what's different to what and what's probably related and where did it come from. Um, so the, sec the second question here is who does the IP belong to once the data is analyzed by your team? Um, so the original uploaded sequence data belongs to the person who uploaded it, right? Um, the phylogenetic tree itself, that's a good question. I don't know. I would have to talk to it yet and get back to you, but I would assume that it is owned by the whole loss tracker network nationally or by the governing body like the CDGN. Like it doesn't belong to, I assume it doesn't belong to us <laughs> because it is, it is users data from patients all around the country. Um, and three, how is data security maintained? Oh, so we have, um, everything's kept in house, right? It never leaves our servers. Um, the only thing that people outside the app see is the tree. So people upload that. Um, the platform that's currently being used for the app has security layers in it and the cloud server where it's hosted has security layers in that as well. And we have had um, collaborators who have, I say collaborators, but people involved in the, the service provision level from the university who've gone through and looked at the security of those servers and done some, some testing. Okay, so can you comment on the scalability of national teams? I, you touched on the complexity of different jurisdictions. Do you meet regularly? Has each state brought different sources, different sequencing machines? Um, so no, so for SARS-CoV-2, all kinds of things have been used um, because it all happened so fast. So it's not uniform and it would be good if it were. So hopefully one of the developments that would happen will happen is that we can start uh, running some analysis pipelines to make this more uniform. Um, but on the other hand, because it is a slowly evolving viruses, the genomic differences aren't huge. There's not like rearrangements and, and things. So um, hopefully it, it will be obvious if there's something wrong or something inconsistent between the, the sequencing. Um, at the moment, we've only had some ad hoc. So the CDGN, sorry, the CDGN meets regularly. Um, the users themselves meeting with us, like the, the development team has just happened on an ad hoc basis so far. And we also talk to them, there's a, a Slack for users. Um, but we are about to start doing that more regularly. So the governing, the governing body, the CDGN does me regularly. Uh, question, may I ask what is the method used for phylo phylogenetic tree regeneration? Is it a neighbor joining tree or likelihood based? So at the moment it's using IQ tree, which seems to be what kind of everyone is using. Although there has been some discussion about SARS-CoV-2 being a special case, um, which is a likelihood based phylogenetic tree. So it's, it's kind of standard. And in answer to the second question, what is the reference genome used? Um, usually people use the Wuhan reference genome, right? Which is the reference genome that China produced really early on in the process. Um, but people have been known to use other references as well. Um, let me go out of order. So how much of the genome do you use for analytics? Um, are we losing diagnostic re resolution by using only a fragment of the genome as it's a slowly mutating virus? No, so we are actually using the whole genome. It, it, we do. Um, and that's actually one of the things that's been discussed. So when I say it's a slowly mutating virus and that can make analysis hard, it means Australia's had a policy of we'll sequence everything and we will 
be quite aggressive in uploading sequences. So if someone has carried out sequencing and the quality wasn't great, they still will upload it and make it available for analysis. But if you do sequencing and it doesn't work very well and you don't get coverage of the full genome and you're using the whole genome, then it's obviously harder to compare it to the other genomes. And if the virus was slowly mutating and there's maybe only a couple of SNPs between this patient and that patient, and then one of them has lost some coverage of the genome, maybe you lost coverage of a couple more SNPs that would have turned out to be different, or you don't know. So um, it's, it's almost the inverse. We are using the whole genome and maybe that is an issue because it means that the analysis can be skewed by loss of quality. So sometimes we have to, um, we have to flag samples where the quality is lower, but we don't, we do, we do take everything into account. Okay. All right. I think we've exhausted the questions. There's, there's lots of comments in there thanking you for a great talk, Claire. There's also a nice comment to wrap up on, I think that, um, Perhaps Oz Tracker be, being up and running is the silver lining in the uh, COVID-19 cloud. So um, with that, I uh, would like to thank you once again, Claire, for taking the time to talk to us today. Thanks very much, Christina. And thank you everybody for all your questions and for listening. So I'll just briefly close the webinar today. So as I mentioned, we'll notify you when the recording is publicly available in the next few days. Uh, but this webinar is part of a series of bioinformatics training events organised by Australian BioCommons. You can find out more about upcoming webinars, workshops and events at any time on our website. And you can also watch uh, recordings of previous events on our YouTube channel. So finally, we'd like to acknowledge our funding the Australian BioCommons is enabled by Inchris via BioPlatforms Australia funding. Thanks so much for watching and we hope you enjoyed today's presentation and that you'll join us again soon. So until next time, goodbye. Thank you.